Hello, this is Spellbinder doing a report again on the book 2012 Science of Superstition. I'm going to cover the Galactic Center uh, passing and the procession of the equinox as well as a possible binary star system that we have which could be what Nebiru is orbiting. If that was what Nebiru is a planet then it's orbiting a binary star and it's not just a planet going way out and coming way back in it's actually orbiting around a brown dwarf or maybe a red dwarf of very low temperature but this is how this goes uh, as we have discussed John Major Jenkins central claim is that the ancient Mayans carefully designated the 13th Bakhtun cycle of their long count calendar so that it would roll over to begin the next age during the December solstice of 2012, which he says coincides with the solar alignment with the galactic center, or what he says the Mayas called the rebirth place. In the sky, Jinxon claims that the Mayans would only have been able to calculate this alignment by having full knowledge of the procession of the equinoxes, which he claims was known to the ancient Mayas at least 2,300 years ago. In his book, Galactic Alignment and the Transformation of Consciousness, according to the Mayan, Egyptian, and Vedic traditions, Jenkins introduced us to Sir Uttreswar, the early 20th century Indian Kaira Yoga guru who wrote The Holy Science, published in uh, 1894. In this book, Sir Uttreswar propose replacing the traditional Hindu calendar with one that is based on our sun's 24,000 year orbit around a companion star, making Sir Uttreswar's perhaps the first person in modern times to allege that our sun is part of a binary star, star system. He also claimed that it was this binary orbit that is responsible for what is perceived from the surface of the earth to be the procession of the equinoxes, not the subtle wobble of the earth caused by luma, luna solar forces as mainstream science would have us believe. Sir Utrasawar is saying a mouthful here. He's not only is he suggesting that our solar system is part of a binary star system, he says that we are also orbiting around the galactic center and or the center of the universe and that our orbital position with respect to the seat of the creative power has a direct relationship with our inner lives and with the manner in which we are expressed as civilization or as individuals. The binary stars theory. Research into Sir Yuktas War's proposal is currently being conducted by the Binary Research Institute, founded by Walter Crutter or Critton, then author of the book Lost Star of Myth and Time, and writer, producer of a documentary on the topic untitled The Great Year, narrated by James Earl Jones. Procession, not a local wobble, a grand ellipse through the heavens. This new explanation for procession is it's not a wobble on this axis of the Earth. They are suggesting that our star revolves around a companion star, like 80% of all the stars in the heavens. Our sun is in a binary system and therefore is on a great orbit through the heavens and dragging, of course, all the planets with it. That journey through the heavens would produce exactly the same observable effect of the changing position of the stars down through the ages. Graham Hancock on camera interview in the 2012 Science of Superstition. Turn you got to see the documentary also called of the same name. Uh, researchers or research between the early 1800s and today suggests that many stars are part of either binary star systems or star set systems with more than two stars called multiple star systems. A binary star system consists of two stars orbiting around their companion central or center of mass. The brighter star is called the primary and the other is its companion or secondary. Speculation about the existence of a mysterious twin to our own sun abounds. The twin is thought to be a brown dwarf of substar that is too low in mass to sustain stable hydrogen fusion. Brown dwarfs are difficult to find as they emit almost no light and have cool outer atmospheres. Their strongest mission in this 
in the infrared spectrum and their composition is characterized by the presence of uh, lithium and sometimes methane. Walter Cuttington at the Binary Research Institute, Professor Richard Muller at the UC Berkeley, and Dr. Daniel Whitmore, Mertmeyer of the University of Louisiana, amongst other several, have long speculated on the possibility that our sun might have and yet undiscovered small companion with a highly elliptical orbit. In 1983, Richard Mullen, prompted by his guru at UC Berkeley, Luis Alvarez, came up with the, nimerous, nim, uh, the nemesis theory that a brown dwarf companion to our sun makes its closest approach to the edge of our solar system every 26 million years, perturbing its orbits with the comets and the Oort cloud, sending them on, in a direction in accounting for the regular intervals of mass extinctions on Earth. Daniel Whitmire had simultaneously come up with a similar conclusion with a computer scientist, Albert Jackson, as did the uh, New York University, Michael Rampino. More on the 1998 Schieber hypothesis. Uh, Whitmire is co-author with John J. Maltese of the 1999 peer, peer-reviewed paper Contrary evidence of a massive body in the outer Oort cloud, which notes the anonymous distribution of the behaviors of comets at the edge of our solar system, and predicts a brown dwarf perturber at a distance from the Earth of approximately 25,000 astronomical units, which is acting in cons- concert with the galactic tide, is causing certain comets to be more easily observable from Earth. On his website, Whitmire appends that the perturber is a dwarf, a T-dwarf, which is a class of even lower mass, lower temperature, and lower luminosity dwarf than regular brown dwarfs, with the coolest one measured so far at around 388K or 240 degrees Fahrenheit, just a bit hotter than a pot of boiling water at sea level. And then they go on and talk about Sedna and its effects. And they're saying that couldn't be it. And they talk about evidence of our dark companion at the edge of our solar system. But what I thought was going to be neat is the Earth losing its mojo. Yes, the Earth has a mojo. Ah, it's a short answer. Yes. A very interesting observation by Canadian science writer Mary Sue Halliburton confirmed my own intuition about the extinction of the North American megafauna and how the surviving animals were often smaller versions of the ones that didn't make it past the end of the last ice age. It is not only the direction but also the strength of this magnetic field that is a concern. In the time of the dinosaurs at an estimated 2.5 Gauss it was 80% stronger than it is now. This may have been one of the reasons such galactic life forms thrived. It is now accepted that the catastrophic event ended in the reign of the giant reptiles. However, they did not re-evolve or equate dimensions, and the disappearance of the mammalian megafauna in most recent time is still considered to be a mystery. The mastodons and the mammoths would have towered over modern elephants. Why are there so few large terrestrial animals today? The smaller average size of the modern animals may be due to the gradual decline of the Earth's magnetism. Thousands of years ago, the Chinese, with their astute discovery of bioelectrical energy flows known as meridians, learned that the magnetism promotes vigor in biological life. They use magnetic rocks in their medical treatment. In the past century, there have been further declines of the Earth's magnetic field by another 5% down to only 0.5 Gauss. 2.5 to 0.5. People were losing our magnetic field. That's no doubt. It is isn't 
known exactly what would happen if the Earth's magnetic field were to drop to zero Gauss, it is guessed that the electronic devices and satellites might cease the functioning, that migrating animals might lose their sense of direction, that the atmosphere might expand and become thinner, causing altitude sickness at sea level, and that deadly cosmic rays could eventually kill all life on Earth's surface. Some life-loving folks have been building underground bunkers, believing that this is the only way that they will survive Anyone who wants to be completely paranoid and assume of some form of survival should have access to a comfortably outfitted underground bunker with all the MREs and TP and other necessities to last at least 11 years. It may be of some comfort or not, depending on your point of view, to know that the Solid, the uh, Solid Bird Global Seed Vault, a secure seed bank located on the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen, contains a wide variety of plant seeds from locations worldwide in an underground cavern to provide a safety net against accidental loss of diversity in the event of a major region or global catastrophe. Would a geomagnetic reversal be catastrophic? Sword answer, no but it could cause other things. Or they made the seed vault because they're going to release all the GMO crops on the planet that's going to infect all the plants that aren't GMO and make them GMO or modified organisms. And they're going to become highly toxic to human consumption or basically any animal's consumption. I mean, the honeybees have been eating pollen from Monsanto's corn and other plants that they've uh, put Roundup concentration that absorbs into the plant. Remember, you're eating that Roundup when you eat corn. It's, it's Roundup resistant and absorbs that stuff to kill the pest. I mean, that's just my, my whole thing about all this. It's just, that's what they're up to, I mean, they're up to doing something. I'm not really sure what they're doing, but I know the GMO, if it gets out there, I mean, now you can't even get alfalfa soon without GMO because they're going to plant GMO alpha and say, huh, we'll just plant it here, and when the pollen spreads through the non-GMO alpha and infects it and makes it GMO, then that will be dangerous to eat. And any animal that eats it, I'm saying, let's just wait here and see what happens when they start feeding this alfalfa to, to certain, certain dairy animals and stuff that eat alfalfa, and see what that does to them. See if it doesn't make them drop over or have miscarriages in their offspring, or their offspring die younger. I mean, that's the only thing I can tell you is it's it's part of Agenda 21, the population control agenda. Because they were saying there's not enough room for all of us and a couple of hundred of them, that they're more important than 6.5 billion people, and that we gotta go because apparently they feel like they have some type of uh, destiny that they're the ones that are rich, therefore they're the ones that get to survive, and the rest of us that aren't rich because of them don't get to survive. It's just madness. It's just all madness. But this is all I got to really say about the galactic stuff. I'm sorry I got off into the GMO and the New World Order's destruction of the human race. I don't know what's going to kill us first. A galactic cosmic event or them? I really don't know. I really can't tell you who's going to kill who first. Is it going to be a natural event from space? Or a catastrophe on the planet? Or is it going to be man-made by these elitist couple of hundred people? Families, maybe. A couple hundred families that run everything. And they're thinking that they're holier than God and above all of us, that the few are more important than the many. When I always thought it was the few for the many. The few will sacrifice themselves to save everyone else. Oh no, in their eyes, everyone's got to save them. So you got to go, and you're not on their save me list. Man, I hate having to go into this, but this is still part of the article. What type of catastrophe is coming in 2012, if any? Will it be 2013 or 2014? Who knows? All we know is that the Mayans have basically said 2012, but yet they're even disagreeing. Some of them down there have come out and said, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Your calendar's off. Your calendar's off by a few years. And there's others that say, yeah, your calendar's off by a few years. So how are we going to know?
No, well, that's all I basically have to say. This is Spellbinder reports on the coming who knows what. Maybe on the 15th of uh, this month, we'll get hit by a large asteroid. Which I'm not really sure what the size of it is, but they're saying there's an asteroid coming at us. There's rumors going already in a rumor mill across the internet. Well, we'll find out around the 10th, because it's supposed to be really visible on the 10th. So if it's going to get real close, we'll see it on the 10th, and you'll give you a couple of days to prepare for your, for your maker. Until next time, be good, or be good at it. Good day.